Thank you for joining us on another episode of Latter Gay Stories Podcast. I am your host, Kyle Ashworth, and as always, this is one of those great episodes. Uh, Today is really fascinating because um, the ninth season of the Latter Gay Stories Podcast is really focused on taking a candid and raw look at the experiences of not only L- the LGBTQ community, but also those who are impacted directly by this topic, uh, specifically families, family members, church leaders, and those uh, who have taken the dedicated effort to better understand and explore this space. Today's podcast episode is just that. Um, our, our guests today are parents of a gay son, and often we hear the uh, emotional and um, meaningful stories of those who are in the LGBTQ community directly uh, as they relate and their experience falls in the spectrum. But today we will hear from parents. What did they do right? What did they do wrong? Uh, Where were their blind spots? How does church and doctrine and dogma play into a topic like this? Those are all things that we're going to discuss on today's podcast episode. We want to thank you for giving us an hour and giving us the opportunity to help better understand this intersection, help us to build bigger and stronger bridges between the LDS and LGBTQ community. It's podcast episodes just like that, just like this, that help us do that. And again, we want to thank you for uh, participating. Some of you wonder how you can best help the Latter Gay Stories podcast. There are a couple ways. One is by sharing this episode. If you are watching on the video version, We invite you to subscribe to this channel, to make a comment, and to follow along. Uh, Sharing this episode is one of the great ways of giving us an extended reach. The second way of helping us build these bridges and expand our reach is by making a donation to the podcast. We're always looking for your donation that helps us to build these bigger and stronger bridges. Uh, Two ways to do that. One, we are Venmo friendly at Letter Gay Stories. You can also make a monthly or one-time donation online at our website at LatterGayStories.org and click on the Donate tab. Now, without uh, wasting too much more time, we want to jump into the podcast episode and welcome Glenn and Sandy Trousdell. Hello. Thanks, Kyle. Good to be here. It's good to have you here. Thank you. Um, With that introduction, we kind of set the Thanksgiving plate and lay out exactly what uh, I think a lot of parents out there needed to hear or some parents who might not know why they need this message or parents who are in your shoes having a child that came out years ago can look back on this episode and say oh yes yes if I would have had that so we're talking about what it's like to be parents of a gay kid and those blind spots on today's episode. What, what didn't you know? What should you have known? And what have you learned since your son come out? How's that? How long do you have? <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the timer's running. <laughs> Before we jump into the, the meat of the podcast episode, let's uh, help our audience get to know you a little better. Glenn, tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you find yourself in this space? And, and why are we on a couch today? <laughs> well, uh, just very briefly, um, I grew up in South- Southern California, moved to Arizona, uh, met my dear wife at ASU. We got married and we, we set off to live the, uh, I guess the stereotypical, prototypical, hopeful Mormon life of, uh, you know, raising a family and going to church and doing all the things we needed to, to, to find happiness and be happy. And so um, that worked out for a while. And then um, at 13, our oldest son came to us and uh, said something like, I think I like boys. And um, our frame of reference at that moment was um, really just a lot of ignorance, right? So I think we knew gay people generally, not anybody intimately, so to speak, no, in, in our friend circle or whatnot. So we were, we were very ignorant, but we also, you know, had a deep belief system, uh, it, and, I, and I call it at this point sort of like a, an adherence to the dogma, you know, which was, hey, I grew up reading Miracle Forgiveness and the messages like that that talked about um, gay as a problem. Um, you know, and the way it hit us was 
was we didn't know what to do, but we loved our son tremendously. So I'll let San Sandy take that story from here. How about that? Yeah, and we'll jump into the, the coming oh, okay. out and that experience. Perfect. But let's get to know you just a little bit better too, Sandy. Okay. Uh, man, we have been uh, hanging out for the last 35 years, married, and I uh, hang out at home and I'm a real estate agent and grandma, Nana. That's my greatest excitement in life right now. How many grandkids? Four. So at 13, your oldest comes out. Yes. Well, no, to us. But it would be another, um, gosh, almost 18 years before he came out to the world. Um, let's go back to that later in the conversation. Um, but yeah, he tells us right before we leave for an appointment with the bishop, uh, this news and you know I said don't worry it's fine don't worry about it and inside I'm saying oh this is a problem we have a problem here and so uh, I did the very um, you know everything's okay everything's fine it's all good and inside m my whole world I thought oh my gosh life is over what the crap this isn't gonna work out this isn't gonna fit how does this fit in our little box, you know, there was instantaneous panic because there was no place in our life where we felt like that would fit because it isn't something that's talked about in the church really, uh, more now than it was almost 20 years ago. It's not talked about, it's not um, acceptable. It's a problem to be solved and that is how we tackled it. From that moment for a long time was we have a little problem, we just gotta get this fixed. So that's sad to me today, but that is where we were at then. It is, and, and I think this brings us into that, that part of the discussion where Glenn, you write to me and say, the, we were on a collision course when dogma collides with ignorance, it was detrimental to my son. And when I read that, being on the other side of this topic, being the gay kid closeted, it made perfect sense. The, the religious aspect of everything that I knew and hold, held sacred fought against something inside of me that, that was screaming, you're okay, but... And Sandy, when you were describing the situation, um, the best line that I, that I loved was weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth. Because that was so vivid and so relatable when it comes to the experience of both the family and also the person who has spent so much time in the closet. So let's, let's kind of dissect that. I, I wanna jump into that a little bit and understand why, uh, Glenn, you felt like dogma and ignorance was the worst thing that could have happened in your experience. And as a result, it was a literal weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth. I can, yeah, I can talk about that. You know, when I, when I think about it, you know, so we, we grabbed our son, took him to the bishop, because that's the way we would solve a problem like that, right? We didn't even think to take him anywhere else, so to speak. So we took him to our bishop, and, and then we got a little bit of hope. I don't know if it was that day or sometime later, you know, hey, uh, there's reparative therapy available. And then th because I was ignorant about the science and about, uh, you know, the reality of LGBT issues, uh, I, I simply just sort of said, okay, there's the path. I have the path. You know, we had a little detour. We had a little problem here. But now we're going to get back on track because we have a plan to solve it. And through that, again, that ignorance um, and then applying the dogma, we took Justin down a path of reparative therapy that um, I now call the biggest regret of my life because of what that did and um, caused him to stay closeted, caused him to have a hope still that he could change when he couldn't change, when he, and he, he did all the things he, he should have, you know, and you know, served a mission and, and just kept chased and all of the things that he was asked to do with, because his belief system, he had the same kind of ignorance and you know, belief systems. 
And it is, he is still struggling with that, so to speak, of sort of undoing that and fully accepting himself as the perfect creation he is. So as he comes out, 13, so young, as he comes out, um, I, I want to, I don't necessarily want to tell Justin's coming out experience without Justin sharing his coming out experience, but I'm more partic- I'm more interested in your first initial thoughts, and then I also want to know about um, your discussion with your bishop and what what advice your bishop was giving you that led you into his office. So those moments when the revelation, the great coming out um, as parents. How did you process it? What were the things going through your mind? And then, as you said, immediately you thought your support system would be a bishop. And what was that conversation like? I will tell you, um, again, you know what? Know better, do better. But I will tell you, my from my perspective, the day that he told us that, there was an instantaneous grief, like, like I said, because we did not have any tools that told us this is not just gonna be okay, but it's a great thing. It's a blessing, it's an amazing thing. It was, that's just not gonna work. We've gotta make that not be that way. You know what I mean? And maybe that's the greatest regret of my life, you know, is just, oh my gosh, if I could do it over again today and knowing what I know today and being able to discuss this with other parents today, which I do on a regular basis, I tell them, you just won the lottery because your life now is going to be freaking awesome if you embrace it. But that's not what I did. All I could picture was, oh my gosh, he's not gonna marry a girl and give me grandkids. Oh my gosh, he's not gonna fit in, quote unquote, in our normal Mormon life. You know, that's, it, it sounds so selfish. And I, I think back today and I think I had no other um, frame of reference to fit that into my, my normal Mormon existence is what I'll say. And so, um, so I cried, cried and cried and cried and cried and cried and cried because how's this going to fit? And, and so as we took that to the bishop, you know, and kind of lay that out in front of him, uh, you know, we felt the comfort, you know, he was, he was a calming influence, you know, it's going to be okay. Maybe this is a phase, that's one alternative. Um, but also yeah. the resource that, you know, they had, um, he talked about, they, they were aware of, a, you know, a therapist who could help us do a reparative therapy thing. And so w- I, without any critical thinking or just sort of checking it out or anything, we just said, okay, that's good. That's, that's what we need because it was a choice. He just needs to make a different choice. There's reasons you know? he's gay and we can fix those things, what we yeah. did wrong. And, uh, you know, through that process, we, you know, we learned about, you know, passive fathers and dominant mothers. And yeah. we started having some guilt and shame about how we would raise him and feeling that we were part of the problem and um, feeling really bad about that as well. Um, so those were the, 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 gosh, I don't know, first two, three, four years, just working with him to do all the activities, to, take, to get him enrolled in sports programs, to help him develop healthy male attractions and things like that. Tell me, let's discuss about, uh, a little bit about this conversion therapy program. How did you get, how did you find a program? How were you led into a program? How did you choose where Justin went? It, it, was, the, it was the reference from the bishop. The specific name, it's, you know, we made an appointment right away and got involved right away directly from that reference. Again, without thinking about anything else, really. There was at the time um, a specific individual um, who was sort of making the rounds, I, I've heard, at stakes um, with bishopric training and stuff like that, who, who was there to, um, you know, offer hope to what they said then was an increasing population of kids that were struggling with this um, same sex attraction. Because um, anyway, and so that's what we heard is there was, there's a specific, 
you know, individual and practice that can help with this problem. And, and so we, like you would expect, we were like, well, well, yeah, we're getting that advice from our ecclesiastical leaders. Well, we're just on it because that's what we did, you know? And, um, and I, I don't remember at the beginning that it was called anything. It was just, there's, there's a therapist who can help him through this hard thing he's dealing with. You know what I mean? So it felt like the loving, you know, like I said, you know, hey, we are parents. We have a problem. We have a son with a problem. We're going to help him fix this problem. You know what? And gosh, the message that we got then, I don't want people to get today. And, and I hope they won't get that today, which is that that's a problem. It is yeah. a problem. It isn't a problem. It's, it's, that is exactly, you know, parents need to not think about doing what we did. It, it was completely the wrong thing to do. One of the great messages that I hope to get across after a couple hundred episodes in the existence of this podcast is the fact that you're not alone, you're not broken, and that your best days are ahead essentially in that order and and I can see how a well intending intended bishop would look at you and say you're not alone there are other parents who are going through this yeah. and here is the remedy because something does need to be fixed and so it's easy to unpack this and that there will be wonderful opportunities ahead when all this goes away um, it's just that we unpack those all in the wrong we, we expected to get a open those up and see a gift that didn't really exist within that box. The, the fixing wasn't that we were changing their sexuality. The fixing was that you were able to now see your son for who and what he was. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Over the, over, yeah. The, over the years, Sandy and I went on our separate and together paths trying to figure it out. You know, um, yeah. you know me, I dived into study. You know, I, 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 I had a question I don't know, it was two or three years into it, I started to question, maybe he's just this way. I, it sort of just dawned on me, like because he's doing everything to change it, but it's not changing. And, and, and it created that, that spark of a doubt. Um, and then I just started, I guess, breaking down and questioning everything. What could I, what could I firmly hold on to as truth and what could I firmly um, grasp? And, and, and you know, I tell Sandy, I, you know, our, our web search history back in those days, I was searching homosexuality all over the place because I was now trying to really understand it, you know, and, uh, and, and I began to have a feeling of, this is okay that he's, he's that way. And um, so I think, I don't know, there was a few times I remember in 2010 hearing Boyd K. Packer talk about this, this and it was a moment that crystallized my experience because most of it was an internal struggle I was having, but when he gave his talk about God does not create gay people, why would he do that, essentially is what the, the lesson was. I stood up and yelled at the TV, no in front of my family, you know, because I just didn't believe it anymore that gay was a problem. But again, um, uh, it, it took a time for Justin to still work through that himself and Sandy was on her own path. But um, I came to that realization, again, study, and I did my own thoughts, my, my, my own praying, my own um, just soul searching and uh, uh, it came to that uh, after a few years that he was just perfect as he was. That it was completely acceptable to not only to feel gay, but to be gay. And I developed this thought that it's not only just loving LGBTQ people, but it's accepting them fully in their full existence, in their full exp expression in their behaviors, all just like heterosexual people including getting married, including having families, including just being, again, completely accepted, not just some patronizing love, right? And, and that's been my, my passion for many, uh, many years now is to really push that message forward. 
this community is awesome. As we've associated with members of this community, we feel the spirit. You know, we feel the, 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 the love. And, um, and I think a little bit too, as I feel like I need to do penance for my past, past problems. I mean, for what I had done to my son, I feel like, you know, as a good religious boy, I need to do some sort of repentance or penance for that. How do we apologize for those old traditions? What do you think, babe? I will tell you that I consider it um, an honor to talk about it every chance I get and with anyone that will listen to me because I am going to pave the way for this to be easier for every Latter-day Saint youth that ever comes out to their parents. And I am going to do my utmost to, to try to prevent other parents from screwing it up because I don't think we could have loved our kid more than we loved our kid. We still, I just feel like that the love was always so intense and so deep and so real, but we still did it wrong. And I, I just consider it a privilege and and I take every opportunity to have conversations about this with every person that I can in my ward, in my stake, in my sphere of influence, anybody. And, and so I get phone calls on the regular from people, Sandy, I need to talk to you. Or um, my mom says that I should talk to you. You know, I live in this state, can we call you? And I go, absolutely when can we get started and and that is just i feel like that is all we can do i cannot go back if i could go back would i go back absolutely would i do it differently yeah but guess what we don't get do-overs in life often you know but moving forward i will never ever uh moving forward make the same mistake again you know and so that's all i can do is i can try my utmost to make it better for the kids coming out and for the parents who might have a tendency to just um, see it wrong. I don't know how else to say it. Yeah, I think uh, this leads me into, I, I think a two part question that I wanna jump into. And I wanna, I wanna really talk about the mistakes. Um, and, and I wanna do this in two parts because Glenn, you brought this up that during the original uh, conversion therapy program, the, the commencement of that, uh, and this is a very common experience, the therapists will say, the cause of this was, and they'll usually list three or four things. One is a overbearing mother, yep. a distant father, yep. masturbation, yep. and then either a non-inherence to religious principles. You're not praying enough. You're not mm -hmm. yep. worthy work enough, harder. work yeah. harder, yep. knock until your knuckles bleed, uh, pray until your knees are calloused, the ultra religious aspect of this. So the nodding means you've went through each of those. Yes. Absolutely. How does that make you feel as parents and, and as parents who listen to this podcast episode who are just beginning this journey or who don't know yet that they need this discussion because their child or children have not yet come out. How does that make you feel as parents to hear that from a therapist who's licensed and has credentials saying that you were the cause of your child becoming gay? Yeah, I'll take that first if you don't mind. Yeah. You know, back then when I was hearing it, I just took it as truth, right? So I internalized it very early on. Um, um, the, I think we both just realized pretty early that Justin wasn't causing this, you know, he wasn't masturbating. He was the most religious kid around. He was dedicated. He served, he did everything he was supposed to. He was, um, really good. So I didn't really see those as like, well, it's probably not those. I know those are probably things that could cause it. But what, what I did see is Sandy has been a very active mother and I have been a little bit passive. I could see maybe there's some truth to that. And we internalized that. I, I'll speak for myself. I internalized that and in not in a healthy way, not in a healthy way. I think I resented Sandy a little bit for her <laughs> dominance. I think I, 
hated myself for my passiveness. And we really would meet and talk about checking ourselves all the time. You, Glenn, you go, you do that. You go talk to him because that's the dominant move and that's I won't. Right. And, and, oh. and so, you know, we were making ourselves other than we naturally were, you know, and, 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 uh, I, then once I got more educated about it, I really felt like we've got to have therapists stop telling people that it's not true. It's not true. Scientific communities all around the world. Uh, are, are, are agreeing that compare, uh, conversion therapy and reparative therapy doesn't work. It's pseudoscience. So, um, yeah, it was a problem. It was a problem in our marriage, frankly. It caused yeah. problems in our marriage. What was your experience like, Sandy? On, on the reverse now, uh, I'm saying like, so not only, not only are these therapists looking at you as parents saying, here were your pitfalls, but now what Glenn's talking about, he even is buying into this and, and looking at you as this source as well. How, how do you internalize and, and process that? You know what? In the same way that, that he's doing that and he's like, y yeah, you, this, this, you know, and I'm like, you know, well, if you weren't so detached, then we wouldn't be in this predicament. You know, there was a lot of blame there again, you know, it was not good for either of us during that period. It was, it was not good for Justin and it was not good for us. You know, we were on the job and um, we were present. We were in therapy with Justin. He was in therapy by himself. And we were constantly, like Glenn said, in this push and pull of, oh, you know, I'm like, well, what am I going to do with my personality? It's still with me and, and I'm supposed to be changing it, you know, and I'm screwing up my kid and, and, it, and I was throwing dirt at him too. It was, it was rough. And again, looking back today, I'm like, that was so wrong to do that. You know, that was so wrong uh, to do that to us, but also again just the fact that we were seeing it all as a problem to be solved it just wasn't a problem to be solved you know and gosh yeah we've discussed this um aspect of of this conversation uh with your bishop in the terms of just your bishop did you reach out to any other ward members where were you as parents outside of therapy turning for support we were all closeted we, that, that was one of the worst things is it was a thing to be hidden still. It was a thing to be kept quiet. It, you know, we had the opinion that if he comes out at high school, that high school will be hard. If he comes out at church and with family, that will be hard. So we talked to nobody. Maybe not nobody. Did we talk to nobody. somebody? Zero people. Yeah, we talked to nobody. But, but we also... From my perspective, we were uh, respecting at that point Justin's wish to, I gotta, I, I'm gonna fix this, mom and dad. I don't want this either. I'm fixing it. So it was just gonna be a period of time and then yeah. it was gonna go away. So why would we why talk Why would we to talk people? to anybody? Because but, it would just be a temporary thing that we yep. would all put behind us. Yep. And you know what? Having said that, I will tell you that I, um, again, looking back, Oh my gosh, you know what? I, I have spoken to people and if we had embraced it and him in the way that we needed to, he would have also embraced it and himself and mm -hmm. not dealt with internal homophobia. And so he would have wanted to tell the world. Yeah. And there was a time when I remember a conversation that Justin and I had where he I don't know that he came out and asked the exact question, but the implication was, mom, are you ashamed of me? You know, that kind of a thing. And again, those weren't the exact words, but the conversation was something along those lines. And I said, are you kidding me? If I felt like I could, I would scream it from the rooftops if that's what we were doing, you know, because no, because Justin was the perfect kid, the perfect kid. But I remember that, and then at the same time thinking, but we can't, we're not doing that. Yeah. I did not tell my my own mother. I mean, 
I did not tell anyone because it was not my story to tell. And so could we have used support? Maybe we would have come across someone smart who said, hey, oh, yeah. hey you idiot parents, you know? Hey, you don't need to do this. Yeah. It's super exciting to have a gay kid. Yeah. I mean, that's what we, uh, we again, yell at people now. Like yes. when they come, I just want to come downstairs when she's talking to somebody and just celebrate. <laughs> you have a gay kid? That's the right. best thing that could have happened to you. <laughs> yes. But we, didn't. but we didn't know that that was a future. That was a th possibility for us to just shortcut that whole thing into a celebration. Wow, we could have saved years. We could have been pain for years. Yes, with people, but we didn't. But we, and honestly, again, I I take full responsibility for the fact that um, probably our son felt like. I can't talk about this because it didn't fit in our Mormon world. That's yeah. so sad, you know? Um, but as time went on, we took our cues from Justin who's getting older, you know? And and there came a time when we're like, are you, are you gonna ever come out? Because we were ready, you know, we were ready. He had really, like he said, done so much reading, so much research, so much learning, and we were coming around and we were completely evolving. And and then we were talking to Justin, you know, and, and we were like, okay, we're ready. Are you ready? You know what I mean? And, and uh, is there damage from staying in the closet from the time you're 13 till the time you're 30? Oh, yes, there yes, is. Yes, there is. Absolutely. And that's a long time, but any amount of time. Yes, take the time to, you know, tell the important people as a family or whatever, but you make sure um, parents, and this is me, like I said, if I could change anything, you make sure that they know that you will be ready and on board as soon as that's their desire. If it's tomorrow or if it's a week from now or whatever, you are there and that you will be on the party bus and ready to go. I want to talk about Justin at home and partially uncloseted and Justin in community. Were there two different people? Oh yeah. Without question. Yeah, he went to, he went to all the proms and the dances and the friend groups and played heterosexual Justin. He uh, played volleyball in high school because, you know, we encouraged him to get involved in the sports, you know, you know, back then. And so, yeah, he, he, there was two Justins, clearly was. Um, All the while. But he. Depression. Yeah. Right? yeah Depression, he was, anxiety, migraines. Yes. All of that. Sorry. But, he, but he didn't come home. Again, maybe we're idiot parents not seeing it and recognizing it because he was just good at home too, you know, and did all his church callings and just did everything, prepared for a mission, went on a mission. He did all the things. But as we've talked to him, you know, in, in the recent years, yeah, he suffered tremendously. He suffered tremendously keeping that all in. Um, and. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and here's one of the things I would want to say to parents too. Our experience was Justin did not act out, you know, and I think sometimes parents will see their kid who comes out as gay and is also as acting out in other ways, you know, and want to say, well, it's all part of their acting out. And, and I want to say, no, 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 it's not. And don't, don't fall for that. Don't think that teenagers act out. They just do. Justin didn't because that's just who he was, you know, but I think that hit it from us a little bit too, you know, cause he just kept it together seemingly so well, but doing tremendous damage to his soul, to his heart. Um, he, there's this, this, there's this concept and he, he's talked about this. He did have suic uh, suicidal ideations. He did because he literally could, he, he would have these thoughts. If I die now while I'm chased, I'll be fine in the celestial kingdom. Or why would I continue on in this life if there's no hope for me in this life to be who I really am? And you hear that story over and over and over again. And, 
And I just want to shout from the rooftops. This is not a trivial question, people. There are kids who are, are suffering serious mental, emotional, spiritual, soulful damage up to and including taking their own life because they're internalizing the messages that tell them they're not good enough, that they're okay to come and sit in the back of the church and put your arm around you, but not fully participate in who they really are. Um, I said the words to um, a, a bishopric guy who showed up at our house one day. Um, without giving the specific, specific details of that conversation, one of the things that he said was, oh yeah, we've had a conversation, my wife and I, and we just feel like there's just more gay people because of um, pesticides in crops and GMOs and, you know, and I find myself, my hair going, like I'm gonna get ticked here, you know? <laughs> and, and then, um, I said to him, do you recognize just how damaging some, saying something like that is? Oh, you are defective, but we can explain away your defects by talking about pesticides and GMOs. I said, do you realize how damaging that is? You know, And I said, there are gay kids all around that are hearing, oh, it's okay that you're gay. Don't worry. It's going to be remedied in the next life. The Lord's going to make you perfect in the next life. And I said, and then you've got these kids that are going to dispatch themselves to the next life by killing themselves because what the heck, at least I'll be perfect then. So I said, you have got to be very, very careful about the messaging and just at what feels like just a little innocuous comment like that. No, that is not okay. You know, and he got that message at that moment, but we have to be so careful. And I, I remember very specifically Justin saying, I just don't want to be here anymore because why would I spend the next 60 years on the earth um, if I'm going to go to hell? Okay, so why would I spend 60 years in hell here being lonely and celibate only to go to hell in the next life? Why wouldn't I, if there is supposedly going to get a fix, why wouldn't I just get there quicker? Because this is hell on earth here. How sad is that? That that is the message that we are sending. We can't do that. You were opening up the door to a very candid conversation that's super uncomfortable for Mormons. Yes. Currently, um, and I'm sure throughout your journey, you were well aware of the gay and Mormon uh, website, uh, yeah. Mormons and Gays. Yeah. Um, dot org, and then it switched to mm -hmm. Gay and what was Mormon it? and Gay. Mormon and Gay, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah the Mormon yep. and Gay website, and then uh, today's version is is the the church's website, but it's it's held under the umbrella of the same sex attracted section. In two thousand and six, uh, Elders Oaks and Wickman sat down for a church interview, a PR interview, where they discussed a lot of the things that we've discussed today, one of those was, is this permanent? Is, is this condition, as it was mm -hmm. spoken of in that interview, is this condition permanent? And the answers from the two um, general authorities was no, that it will be changed in the next life, exactly what you're speaking of. And I think the unfortunate part, and the, the reason why this is so uncomfortable, is it's not doctrinally based. It's, it is a hypothetical best guess um, quick fix for a really difficult problem that the church doesn't have an answer to and I couldn't agree with you anymore when you say um, do you want to get on a high-speed rail towards suicide tell these young kids that their problems will be taken away in the next life it's it's just welcoming that ideation because they want to do good. They want to be good. They don't want to be a disappointment. Will you withdraw yourself from me, Mom? Will you still accept me? Will you still love me? Those things are heartbreaking. The fact that our young kids are thinking these things 
is heartbreaking. And our very best religious answer is, well, you'll be fixed in the next life. We have to do better than this. We have to. Yeah. We have to. I would say we simply don't have to believe what they said about that. We do not have to have confidence that they're right about that. There's a lot that church leaders have been wrong about in the past. Okay? Let's hold open um, the idea that they might be wrong. Okay? And just love and accept these kids perfectly. Y you know, I don't know, maybe you ought to take over from here on that subject. <laughs> no. uh, I, I think we should dig into this a little bit okay. because I think you're in, you're in territory that is uncomfortable and it's uncomfortable because we don't talk about it. Yeah. So um, you say, and I'm just gonna play devil's advocate for a second. You say, dig in and love these kids. Religion says, avoid the appearance of evil. Don't associate yourself with people who are sinning. How do we combat that message? If embracing your son and accepting him for who and what he is and encouraging him to date, encouraging him to be authentic in who and what he is, doesn't that counteract the whole message of the church and religion? It, I'll, I'll try, it's a difficult subject, and I will, I will dig in on this and, and uh, be transparent. I will not accept a God that does not accept my son as who he is, it fully who he is, and as he was created to be who he is. And so when I say that, I give myself permission to just love freely, wholly, and completely. And the thing I get out of that is the best feeling I can have of love and acceptance. And I don't have that wrestle in my heart anymore because, again, I, I worked through a lot of things over a lot of years and have came to that, come to that conclusion that the God that I envision that I would accept as my God, as my father, is much like my father on earth, who was a great man, who loved me unconditionally and accepted me fully. And I know Justin, I know the soul that he is. If there is a God that would set him aside because of who he loves and how he loves, it makes no sense to me not in my mind and not in my heart. So I just reject that out of hand at this point. Now, Glenn, your faith transition or nuance happened a little sooner than Sandy. Hearing him explain that today, was your heart in that same spot? Was your mind in that same spot at 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 year old Justin's experience? Or at what point did you get to that point where you said, I'm not as, I'm not focused or I'm not as in, in connection with the religious message as I am with the authentic part of who my son is? That is a loaded question. Even today, Glenn and I are not on exactly the same page um, when it comes to lots of things related to the church. But in this particular subject matter, both of us fully embrace and accept our son. Yes, he um, did all the research and all the study and he started coming around to, but, but what if they don't have this right? What if, you know, what if the church has it wrong? And I'd say, oh, I don't want to do that. You know what I mean? I, that was nervous. Slippery slope. Yep. I was scared. So yeah, he became nuanced way before I did. No question about it. Um, having said that, uh, still for me today, when Glenn describes how he just described that, it's a little different for me. There's no um, doubt in my mind about Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ and how they see my son in my head. I don't uh, spend a, a lot of time worrying about how Heavenly Father and Jesus see my kid. I worry about how this church that I love is seeing my kid and treating my kid. But I don't spend a lot of time um, 
It doesn't concern me. And if you know me, I worry about pretty much everything, but I don't worry about that. I know how much they love my kid because I have had many experiences throughout my life knowing full well that Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ know my kids very specifically and individually. So I don't worry about the afterlife. I know darn well they made him exactly as he is. Having said that, what has become necessary for me is I am now what um, has sometimes disparagingly been referred to as a cafeteria Mormon. It became important for me. It wasn't too many years ago for me um, where I was like, yeah, cafeteria Mormon. Oh, you know, want to be that. I never oh. do that. Yeah, those are people who aren't all in. OK, guess what? Now I'm like, whoever goes to a cafeteria and takes one of everything, I don't know anyone or we would get sick. And in this particular instance, if I chose and if these amazing kids chose to embrace every single aspect of what they're being told about who they are and that they're broken, then they would get sick if they took that in and ingested that part of the cafeteria food. Do you follow me? 100%. So we're going to so, we're going to reject that offering, aren't we? Right. I am a proud cafeteria Mormon <laughs> and I and I'm still also um, I'm an attending member. I will be anyway after this COVID stuff's over. And so I it's still very important to me, but also what is critically important to me is that I am going to be a voice until my last breath. I am going to be a voice for um, these kids and these adults and humans that uh, don't have a voice. And I will say it, like I said, every opportunity that I can, and I do, and I am transparent about it with my leaders and everybody who knows me knows it. I am very outspoken about um, exactly how much I embrace and believe that these are perfectly created human beings, perfectly imperfect, just like me and him and you. Oh, sorry. And so, you know what I mean? So, uh, yes, we're all one and the same human family, you know, and it's got to get better. And I, and I hope and pray that it's going to get better, but I'm sure as heck going to be around to make sure that there's not damage done in my purview. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I, and I want to jump into this space about what will it take to make this better. But before we get to that part of the interview i want to i want to jump on something that i that you just brought up um, your discussion with church leaders um, this topic i know that there are people listening to this episode saying i would love to be more open i would love to share this but i fear what my neighbors would think what my ward members would think my bishop and my stake president and their relation to this card that i carry or potentially couldn't carry meaning the temple recommend let's explore that what is your advice to those well-meaning latter-day saints who think similar to you but aren't vocal about it because of fear of what other people will think or say my advice is be true to yourself and let the chips fall and so say it say it out loud with no fear of retribution. That's how I feel. And, and not only how you feel, that's how you've been. Talk about your experience with your, your leaders you being that way. When the, when the Temple Recommend questions recently changed, question seven changed to do you support or promote, blah, blah, blah. You know what I'm talking about, right? Um, I can't remember the exact wording, but do you support or promote, you know, organizations that are uh, contrary, run contrary to whatever. the churches? And so positions. as soon as I heard question seven had changed, I dialed up the executive secretary and said, I, I need to meet with the bishop. And so I went and I met with him and I sent my temple recommend on the desk across from between us. And, and I said, he said, I think I know why you're here. And I said, I think you do too. And he said, question seven. And I said, yep. 
And he said, okay, so what do you want to talk about? And I said, what I want to talk about is what you already know about me. I absolutely support gay marriage. I support my son, but I don't just support just my son and love only my son. I support everyone like my son, <laughs> that they should be able to do this and I will be outspoken about it and I will not be silenced. And, um, and he just smiled and said, I know that, Sandy, you know? And I said, I know, but I just want you to know that I am willing to give this up, to give this back to you, this recommend that I've had my whole life. I'm willing to give it back to you, but I am not going to be, I, I have to be transparent about exactly where I'm at. Okay, we have a conversation. It was a great conversation. He said, don't worry, you are good. You are good to go. Continue to, t to attend the temple. Perfect. I go in for my interview with, um, a member of the stake presidency, okay? I already knew from talking to the bishop that he had shared this with the stake president. And before I even came in, hey, guess what? Sandy Trostall's coming in, I bet I know why. And they conversed about it. And he said to me, and Sandy, lest you feel concerned about what the stake presidency people feel, don't worry, we already talked about you, you know, and everything's fine. And I'm like, okay, and he's right. You know, I was like, oh, I, well, this went well, but you know, so I went and uh, that particular day, the individual that I spoke with um, was busting through the questions quickly, right? And um, got to question seven and blah, blah, blah. Do you support or promote? And I, I said, well, I, I just need to say, you know, I, I've got a gay son and I, I just need you to know that I, and I, I lay it out there again, you know, I do, I support and promote it, you know? And, and he says, uh, Oh, well, there's nothing wrong with loving your son. And I said, yeah, it's more than just loving my son. It's that I believe that this is an okay thing for people to be gay, to get married. And so, and I, and I'm vocal about that because I didn't want it to be chalked up to you, love your son, go ahead and love your son. And so I was very clear. And he said, um, and again, I'm, I'm making this difficult, right? Because we're supposed to just hurry and get through these questions to get on to the next person, right? And, uh, but I again clarify, and then he says to me, Sandy, as long as you're not marching in gay pride parades <laughs> and doing stuff like that, you're fine. And I said, oh, I did that last year, and next month I'm doing that again. And he just looked like shell-shocked, you know? And um, he said, you're fine. <laughs> and we blew right past it. And you know what? I'm like, okay, I get home. He says, how did that go? I tell him the story. And he goes, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to talk to the stake president. I'm going to march right back in there. Because I said, he signed it, but I'm not using it until I go back in. And I did. I went back in and I had a conversation a week later. And I laid it all out and again was told, "It's okay. you are fine. So I would say... Be transparent, be true to yourself. But I will tell you that I've heard stories of people who are told because of that, you can't have a recommend. And if that's what they were to tell me tomorrow, then that would be a, that would be an easy decision for me about what my choice would be. And that would be that I, I choose to be true to myself when it comes to this. And I feel very supported by my father in heaven. I don't wonder about how he feels. I think that's a great point. And I think for a concerned Latter-day Saint in this space who is worried about um, supporting the marginalized or this topic in particular, just I think there's a great opportunity for you to jump into the words of the apostles and the direction from the church because Elder Christofferson, Elder Cook, Elder Anderson have all been on the record saying you it's can. okay mm -hmm. yes. and that you can get a temple recommend. That's right. The caveat has always been are you using your advocacy to pull people out of the church? Right. And, and actively, the, the word is actively pull people out of the church. Right. Um, with intention. And if that's, if that's the case, the church seems to have, have a problem. If you are advocating for the health, benefit, and safety of the marginalized in, it, in, in this space, and if that sometimes does include taking a break from church, I don't know that the church is concerned about that. Yeah. And yeah. and there's there's 
there's great precedents there that the church has already laid down in a foundation to help members su- support this space, which I think is a s- saving yeah. grace. Yes. No question. And there's, there's just a bigger picture here at work um, than even than the church. There's a bigger picture, and that is I was put on this earth to be my best self and to do what I feel is the right thing. And so at the end of the day, again, let the chips fall because I will be able to sleep at night and go to my grave knowing that I did the right thing by these people who absolutely deserve nothing but the same thing the rest of us do, which is love and connection and the ability to live as they were created. And so... No more mom, are you ashamed of me conversations. (laughs) Oh no, none of that. Zero of that. Let's talk about how we do better. Let's give some advice. If uh, you were to sit toe-to-toe with a member of the Quorum of the Twelve or First Presidency, what advice would you give them as a mother of a gay son, as parents of a gay son? I'm guessing we're going to get two different pieces of advice here. (laughs) Probably. Glenn would have probably a lot more advice. I'll just say that. Let's start with Glenn then. (laughs) Go for it. And then we can soften the message with you, Sandy. No, just (laughs) kidding. I'd say it's inevitable. It's inevitable. Let's just do it now. Full acceptance of our LGBTQ people. The church will shrivel up and shrink as we would have if we didn't set polygamy to the side. Okay? As we would have if we didn't set the, uh, the, the blacks and the priesthood issue aside. We will have to, at some point, fully accept LGBTQ individuals and full fellowship into the church why don't we just do it now? Because the coming up generation, <laughs> they have lived with openly gay people in their classes. It's just not an issue for them. And, and, and more and more, this is affecting the church. It is, it, the church is losing people who it wouldn't otherwise have lost over these, over these questions and these issues and these strains. And we're not talking about the riffraff. We're not talking about... Oh, no. I hope I'm not the riffraff. I mean, so yeah, I would, I would just, I just want to accelerate all of it. And uh, I would be so bold as to give that advice and might not be listened to. I don't know. Sandy. I want to tell you, um, I would share this story. There was a day when Justin and Glenn and I were on a FaceTime call and I asked Justin's permission to share this because this is, in my opinion and his opinion, a pretty sacred moment for the three of us. But we were talking, the three of us, and he said, um, he shared with us that he has this recurring um, movie in his head, like a dream, but it's during the day, it's at night. And he said, he's telling us this this day, he says, I. I'm walking up to this building and he says, I can see inside this building, you mom and dad, and I can see my siblings and I can see various family members and some super close friends. And he said, you're all inside this building. And he said, I walk up to the building and I, and I try to open the door and I can't get in because the door's locked. And I just keep trying to get in and everyone I love is inside that building, but I can't get in. He loses it and starts to sob and I say son don't you ever worry that you can't get in because if we're ever inside somewhere because I'm being a little thick-headed here at this moment I don't get the moment yet but I said if we're ever inside somewhere we will absolutely let you in don't you worry about that you know and he said mom don't you see you don't have the authority to let me in he said I, I want in, you want me in, and you don't have the authority to let me back in the building, essentially, you know? And that just hit me. And I, I would want so clearly to paint that picture that we're inside the building and we are leaving outside of the building people that want to be in that building. And, and we are losing some of the best, if not the best, people because of this 
policy slash doctrine slash whatever you want to call it we are losing them we are losing them because people get tired and finally recognize that the damage is just too great and they and they they step away but they don't choose willingly often they're being ostracized and that is not what our savior jesus christ is about it just isn't so that's what i would want to share but i would say it nicely because i i want to be listened to you know what i mean i think that, i think that's great advice oh, i'm trying to think which direction i want to take i do want to i i want to discuss in this this same vein your advice to parents what resources were available to you that were helpful in this space that you could offer to parents who are just navigating this journey um, in the thick of it? Is there anything profound, anything that comes to mind that was a great resource that helped you? I know as we've had this discussion, a lot of this was personal study, a lot of this was empirical data, the experiences of your son and, and trial and error. Are there resources out there that you say, oh, this would be a, this is something you should jump on? There's lots now. You want to talk about a little bit uh, uh, some of the resources that are available now? I would say um, the first thing is is become acquainted with lots of gay people. Brene Brown says it's hard to hate people um, that you're close to, so move on in or whatever that quote is. I just butchered it, but something like that. Uh, expose yourself to people that you can get to know because you will fall in love with that community. That's A1 number one. Um, Richard Osler has done a fantastic job with his podcast and with his book. Um, his book has no shortage of just quotes and stories of people. Read them and fall in love with them. Those are great resources. Listen to the podcast from the beginning, from its inception, um, where he talks to people and and surround yourself with people who are embracing their gay kids and um, call people up and say, hey, I heard you had a gay kid. Let's talk about it. You know what I mean? There's, and there's Facebook groups, you know, the Mormon Building Bridges and the All I'll are Walk All, With You. All Walk With You. Uh, yeah. Locally, we have the All Community here in Arizona and uh, it was great before Corona, but we hope to get together again always receiving new parents into it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's a good resource to just like, we're not alone. We're not alone. And there's all spectrums of ways folks have figured it out, right? Um, so the, the, those resources. Uh, of course, your your podcast is Absolutely. awesome as well. Latter Gay Stories has got some great, great content. And then your chronology you put together is just a really great sort of, uh, do you want to see what, the church, with the, as you say, the crossroads between LDS and um, um, LGBTQ, uh, great resource as well. There's so much like that to, that can help educate. And, you know, it's hard because people want a safe place to, you know what I mean, to land, it's, uh, at least originally. And I think that's where some of these Facebook groups are, are good that way. Because I think the hard reality is that there are no church resources oh, no. in right. this space. Right. Doesn't exist. And we can be very can candid and honest about that. Yeah, Mormon and gay is not the place to go or whatever they're doing there because it really only shows one one narrative. And in my opinion, it's usually a, a, a very temporary state. Most people don't stay in that state, whatever they're and portraying. I call, it, I call it soft focus because it's been altered and adjusted to, to fit a very specific angle yeah and that's it and not many stories fit into that exactly. small channel exactly i'll walk with you the facebook group i'll walk with you is uh lds parents of gay children and um many of which are you know staying connected or want to stay connected and want to make it all fit and it's it's just a fantastic resource but as far as church church sanctioned and approved and um, produced. I, 
you will be searching a long time because I just don't know that that exists. Some wards and stakes do have, you, you hear the stories about some people are able to do firesides and whatnot and put together and sometimes they last for a little while and then cross some line somewhere and get shut down but sometimes that's available. Um, what is your advice to that young man or woman or non-binary individual who listens to this podcast and wishes that their parents were like you or wishes that they could come out of the closet? What advice would you give them? I don't know if there's advice. I feel so, I don't know. Um, love yourself. You are perfect. Um, Maybe be patient. We, y'all wouldn't have loved us when our 13 year old, you know, we were ignorant, dogmatic believers. Yeah, we did it wrong. We did it wrong. Um, people, I've noticed in just some of the associations that Sandy's had with people, if you give people a little time, they'll come to it, you know, they'll come to it. There's very, very few people I've seen that just stay completely like, that's evil and that's bad. Um, but encourage, you know, the parents to get involved in these communities. If the parents, they might just be very like, they don't know anything, but if, if they can get turned into these communities, they can get helped and, and sort of soften some hearts perhaps. Patience. But, 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 I, but I would want to tell every young person, this has become a passion of mine, every young person, you are worth it. You have to stay here because it will get better. I'm convinced of that. It is always getting better. And that doesn't mean every day is going to be good and there'll be step backs and hard things. But man, these, um, the LGBT community, the people we have had the privilege of getting to know are so awesome. And we need every single one. We really do. Final words, anything we didn't cover that you wanted to cover? What does the future look like for your family? <laughs> for our family? I don't know. Looking so forward to the day when Justin finds his person. Yeah. And we get to throw a big fat wedding and oh man, just so excited for that and to have another in-law join the family. We look so forward to that and and i would want to talk him into having some kids <laughs> but <laughs> you know every grandparent wants that so. yeah it sounds like selfish grandparents, <laughs> yeah, selfish grandparents. absolutely so we'll the most we'll, selfish um, absolutely but yeah the future of our family and we would want every family just fully inclusive fully accepting uh take the judgments down um if it feels i don't know If you always go to love and acceptance, you're going to be safe. And, and that's the, I, I just want to keep saying, and it's not that hard. It's, uh, let me, let me share one other thought, Kyle, that I, I wanted to say that I've used with people too, is people who don't understand the gay space. I tell them to play the reverse game, just play the reverse game. Simply consider yourself surrounded by 90% of the rest of everyone's homosexual and you're heterosexual. And the religion that you were born into is homosexual um, um, advocating and really doesn't like your heterosexual stuff and doesn't accept it. And what might that be like? What might that feel like for you? And I have found that to be fairly effective if they play at least that imaginary game to at least for a moment see, yeah, that would be hard. Even if they can't accept anything else, at least they can say, yeah, that would be hard to be different like that and not accepted into whatever religious bubble is going on in their life, you know, so. And then move it one step and then, forward and, then, and tell them. And then just. Flip it. You should really flip that. Cause you know what? We know that you, um, you know, you're heterosexual, but you know what? We don't really like that. So we are gonna need you to turn into um, the opposite. Yeah. And they'll be like, well, how, how would what? I do that? I how could I do that? that? I can't do that. That's not no, right. I'm kidding. No kidding. 
and all of the, but the, the happiness you're missing out on, all the spiritual experiences, the blessings of becoming gay, you're missing out on all of those. <laughs> there will be no spiritual experiences yeah. remaining heterosexual. Yeah. And the other flip side of that, you know, and I think this is obviously a nerve, but you, you get into this idea that the heterosexual community says, quit pushing the agenda on us. All that you're doing is, is shoving us down our throats. Every time we turn around, we see a rainbow flag or, or uh, equal opportunities, equal justice. But given your scenario, Glenn, isn't, I mean, living in that type of community, we see all the television advertisements are heterosexual. The print ads are heterosexual. The expectation is that you just get yeah. together and marry someone of your yes. opposite gender. All of those things in our society are geared towards a heteronormal right. uh, yes. uh, a makeup. And so I think it's great advice. Reverse that and Reverse just imagine that. that world. And what would that, what would that look like for the lone heterosexual in a sea of gays? I know right. the heterosexual agenda is so annoying right <laughs> right but that's what it you're that's a great the way you put it that is the heterosexual agenda bombards you all day long it does and it's the heterosexual agenda that believes there's a homosexual agenda yeah <laughs> oh uh, the irony oh the irony oh the irony oh gosh that's a lot we covered a lot of territory yeah in we an did hour. Yeah. it was fun anything else you want to add you know, I, I had a dear friend sit on my couch and say, my child just came out. What do I do? What do I do? Like a conversation that I have regularly, you know, and how did you get here? And believe me, I, I'm a much different person than I used to be. It's just true. It is. And that probably might freak some people out, whatever. I'm good with it. But I said, you are going to 100% fully embrace that child as if your life depends on it, because theirs does. And she said, I know, but we know that if we don't teach our kids, you know, that, you know, the sins of the, you know, that the sins are going to be on our heads, you know, if we don't teach our kids. And I said, the first and greatest commandment is love, right? And that is what you need to do. So all those things you feel like you need to teach your kid, you know, because, but what if they don't want to come to church anymore? And, and you know what, I've been asked that question now regularly, but what if they don't want to come to church anymore? I go, oh my gosh, then accept that, embrace that and recognize that there is damage that will be done and can be done. There just is. Pull some of the literature out right now that is for the youth and you can see some of the damage. But I just said, right now, I want you to take everything you wanna teach your kids and I want you to set it in the back seat of the car and I want you to teach unconditional love and acceptance and have that be the lesson that you are focused and intent on teaching because you will teach them nothing else that is critical. And again, their life depends on it. And that's what matters. The best way to end this nothing nothing but love nothing but love and better yet acceptance <laughs> love leads to yeah yeah that acceptance yeah thank you both of you for sharing uh just a very candid and honest experience it's a pleasure thank you kyle that didn't cost you anything to love yeah uh, i think that's the that's the beauty of the journey Thank you for the work you do. Yeah. You're doing God's work. Yeah. One episode at a time, I suppose. <laughs> Very good. Thank you again. Now, you did mention earlier in the podcast, just as we wrap up, that people do reach out to you. Are you okay if some of our audience reaches out to you? Likely, we'll, you're tagged here on Facebook, so they can reach out, ask questions. Absolutely. You bet. Of course. You're open to that? We can tell them how to do it all wrong, because we did. <laughs> and a better way. <laughs> All right. So a little more philosophy of men and less mingled with scripture. Is that what you're saying? Like, 
<laughs> I'm not saying that. <laughs> I am not saying that. Just kidding. Perfect. Um, so, f- so a free absolutely. opportunity for those who are listening to the, or watching this episode to jump in and, and make that connection. And I think that's you would be a great resource to parents out there and also to the, the LGBTQ community who desires to have some connection to someone who gets it. Of course. And I Happy think it's too. evident that you both get yeah. it. Yeah. Thank you. Again, thank you. You bet. Again, we're grateful for these two sharing their story and grateful that you gave us an hour of your time to better understand the intersection of sexuality and reality. If you felt something um, in this podcast episode, if you learned something new, if you think this episode should be shared, we invite you, if you are watching on the video version, to share this episode or even make a comment uh, to Glenn and Sandy. A question, comment, or just uh, an overall feeling of, of what you experienced in this podcast episode. I really enjoy, you know, this the ninth season, we've really tried to jump into um, kind of the, the difficult parts of this discussion where we can, we can get to the root of uh, hard conversations and kind of the Maya Angelou uh, approach to this. When we know better, we do better. And having Deep discussions like this really give us an opportunity to uh, know better. So uh, we invite you to uh, comment, share, and uh, help us distribute this message throughout your social media feed. And if you are listening on one of our audio versions, we invite you to subscribe to this channel as well. People often ask, what is the best way of helping us uh, in the Latter-day Stories podcast? And it really is just uh, through social media, sharing content just like this. It's the Latter Gay Stories podcast, the deep dive into the intersections of sexuality and reality where it meets at LGBTQ Avenue and LDS Street that really do make differences in this community. But most importantly, it's stories just like this that help us to continue writing your Latter Gay story. <laughs>